children, so I've been hearing about the festival for many years, and uh, I've been encouraged to come for many years, and I've tried to come before, and it hasn't quite worked out, so I'm really glad to be um, here this year. And thank you to the Monastery and Hopkins Society Committee for such a warm welcome, and for inviting you also. Um, it's a real honour to be reading poems um, later on with John F. Dean and Arthur Broomfield, and uh, I really enjoyed it last night, because actually last night she sent me thinking in so many ways, uh, I kind of I wanted I could sit and actually hear her again this morning, uh, and so enjoyed um, Aaron Doyle's concert last night. So it's been a real treat um, from start to finish, and we're really just getting going, I suppose. Um, I set myself really an impossible task for this weekend by trying to deal with um, Hopkins and Irish poetry, and I've realised now that that is in fact um, a PhD topic, and I'm now welcoming a PhD proposal from anybody who wants to spend three years thinking about Hopkins and Irish poetry. I think it would make a brilliant book, and somebody needs to write that book, so it could be you. Um, if I think about Hopkins' influence and legacy, even just in poets of the north, or poets closer to the place that I come from, you know, my mind goes in so many different directions. So I think, for example, about a recent book by Kieran Carson called Until Before After, in which 12 of the poems are just lifted verbatim or modified slightly from Hopkins' journals and papers, edited by Humphrey uh, House in 1959. Poets like Maeve McGuckin uh, and Frank Ormsby have spoken about how important Hopkins was to them, uh, studying him at school and throughout their uh, writing career. Um, the poet Leon Flynn, much more recently, has a brilliant uh, double sonnet called Jared Manny Hopkins, in which she thinks about what she calls her father's wobblers. She writes a lot about her father's experience of Alzheimer's, and she thinks a lot about her father's experience of wobblers. Um, in relation to um, Hopkins and his kind of cliff falls of the mind. And she's thinking a lot about um, sort of mental states and um, there's anti-anxiety medication that's listed in the sonnet. Um, and she's doing really interesting things, I think, with the terrible sonnets in that poem. Or we might think about John F. Dean's poem, Artist, which describes Hopkins as our intent depressive scholar who gnawed on the knuckle bones of words. And gnawed on the knuckle bones of words. Brilliant, and you can hear, I think, there the kind of alliteration and sprung rhythm of Hopkins' verse, getting its way, making its way into the texture of his poetry and of other Irish poets. So I set myself an impossible task, and so I decided to narrow the focus and to think this morning simply about Seamus Heaney and Jared Manley Hopkins. Um, I'm not a Hopkins scholar, I need to kind of clarify that from the outset, um, though it's been a pleasure to go back and think about Hopkins a little bit more for um, today. My interest is really in Irish poetry, as Richard said, and I've been thinking a bit about Heaney and, and Catholic theology and that as well. I think Hopkins for Heaney is a really crucial early influence and example. And I think Hopkins' poems and prose offer Heaney a way to bring theological ideas to bear on his poetic practice. But Heaney is not producing Catholic devotional poetry. There's a kind of secular orientation to Heaney's work, which is important for us to He's not troubled by the ethics and responsibilities of composition in the same way that Hopkins was. I think Heaney is troubled by the ethics and responsibilities of comp poetic composition in relation to other things, like historical violence in particular, but he's not troubled in the same way in terms of a kind of an incarnational poetic, if you like. Um, and I want to think a little bit about the dynamics of mastery and submission this morning too. Mastery and submission. So mastery and submission might lead us on to this phrase, a slave to Hopkins. This is how Heaney described himself as an undergraduate in conversation with Dennis O'Driscoll in the big Stepping Stones interviews, if you knew that book. He says he was already a slave to Hopkins, imitating him and writing in Hopkins speak in his early poetry. Heaney carried with him the Penguin edition of Hopkins' poems and um, with selections from the letters and notebooks. And in one of his most important essays, Feeling Into Words, Heaney writes this. The result of reading Hopkins at school was the desire to write, and when I first put pen to paper at university, what flowed out was what had flowed in. The bumpy, alliterating music, the reporting sounds, and ricocheting consonants typical of Hopkins verse. I should note, by the way, there is a handout circulating, but pretty much everything that's up here is on your handout. I brought it as a backup in case all the technology failed, <laughs> but um, that has not been the case. Thank you. Thank you to the Society of the Gods above that that has not happened. 
Um, so a slave to Hopkins, what, what uh, flowed out was what had flowed in. Heaney also hazards a connection between what he describes as the heavenly, ac the heavenly accented consonantal noise of Hopkins' poetic voice and the peculiar regional characteristics of the Northern Ireland accent. So he talks about that staccato consonantal Ulster accent. I think he wants to try and hear in that voice something of Hopkins' music, just possibly a bit of a push, but you can see what he's trying to do in kind of localising Hopkins' influence. So here and elsewhere, Heaney expresses admiration for the technical aspects of Hopkins' verse, in particular for sprung rhythm and its proximity to the rhythms of speech. Hopkins told his brother Everard, poetry is emphatically speech, speech purged of dross like gold in the furnace, and it's an idea that he makes central to his own developing practice. But beyond the technical aspects of Hopkins' verse, what Heaney is most obviously interested in and enlivened by in Hopkins is his Catholic faith and the way it shapes his compositional practices. In the Stepping Stones interviews, Heaney tells a story about a flyer um, produced about Heaney, uh, which included the news that Heaney had been taught by Hopkins at St. Collins College in Derry. <laughs> it should have read, of course, that Hopkins was an early influence on Heaney. But in telling this story about a misreading, Heaney effectively rereads his biography from the flyer maker's perspective. <coughs> Although not factually true, the flyer sets Hopkins' influence in the context of Heaney's Catholic education, making Hopkins a theological as well as poetic guide. This is a little smaller, hopefully you can read it. Look, you can look at your text, not. At St. Columns College in Derry, Heaney read Hart's Christian Doctrine, Aquinas, and Christian Apologetics, and he described the experience as a monastic regime. He says here, What you encounter in Hopkins' journals, the claustrophobia and scrupulosity and religious ordering of the mind, the cold water shaves and the single iron beds, the soutan and the self-denial, that was the world I was living in when I first read his poems. It wasn't simply a matter of the phonetics taking over. It wasn't just the fireworks in phrases like shining from shook foil. It was the fact that the height and depth of Hopkins' understanding matched my own. The end of As Kingfishers Catch Fire, for example, those lines about Christ in 10,000 places to the Father through the feature of men's faces. To us, that was just a kind of illuminated text celebrating the doctrine of the mystical body of Christ, a teaching that was part and parcel of our religious knowledge classes. He said, when the, dis the discipline when all was said and done was essentially a preparation for religious vocation. Entering a, a seminary, he said, was the ideal conclusion to his schooling. But ordination to the priesthood was not the route he chose. Instead, Heaney went to Queen's, where he was actively involved in Catholic chaplaincy. He made three pilgrimages to Station Island as an undergraduate, and in 1958, he made the Derry Diocesan pilgrimage to Lourdes, acting as a stretcher bearer, altar boy, and thurifer. Of Cayley's in the 1960s, Heaney says, it was a time when everyone was provided with their own inner priest. Temperance was one important example of the inner priest at work. Heaney was part of the local pioneer total abstinence association of which his aunt was secretary and he kept his confirmation pledge until the age of 21. And he probably spent a lot of the time afterwards kind of making up for lost time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Heaney did not enter a seminary. He did not throw off completely the idea of pursuing a religious vocation, albeit by very different means. Heaney often uses religious imagery to express ideas about poetry and the role of the poet. Ideas of inspiration, visitation, catechism, pilgrimage, Catholicism, and Marian devotion frequently populate his conceptualization of poetry, and he often represents the figure of the poet in priestly terms. Interviewed by John Hafferton, he describes being a poet as a vocation, a consecration, a covenant, and elsewhere as a calling. He says, I have some notion of poetry as a grace. From an early age, my mind, my consciousness was always expanding 
in response to the expanding universe of Catholic teaching about eternity and the soul and the sacraments and the mystical body and the infinite attentiveness of the Creator to the minutiae of your inmost thoughts. I didn't have to wait to read the Paradiso to know the vision it entails. For a poet, the one invaluable thing about a Catholic upbringing is the sense of the universe you're given, the sense of a light-filled, Dante-esque, shimmering order of being. You conceive of yourself as a sort of dewdrop in the big web of things, and I think that this is the very stuff of lyric poetry. Ooh, wake us up in the morning. <laughs> Catholicism here functions as a horizon of transcendence that enlivens and enlarges the poet's consciousness. Healy speaks with great passion about the visionary possibility that Catholicism sets alight in the child's mind. In an early sonnet I want to look at this morning, The Forge, we see this possibility at work within its darkness the workshop lit momentarily by the unpredictable fan tale of sparks. Through rhyme, dark and sparks are held in sonic tension. These are enabling contrasts, the bright presence of light in the nothingness of darkness. Likewise, the Thatcher, in Amy's poem of that title, has a Midas touch, turning straw to gold. It's an image for poetry as Hopkins described it speech purge of dross like gold in the furnace. Priesthood profoundly informs human understanding of the poet's role and of poetry's <coughs> potentially sacramental power. Hopkins is a vital influence in this regard. But despite Heaney's claims to enslavement to Hopkins, his priestly conceptualization of the poet's role lies outside religious institutional structures and the uses he makes of Catholic theology ultimately lie in service to poetry rather than to God. So I want to move towards some poems now um, by way of one more thought about theology. And I have called this embracing Catholic theology question mark. Heaney comments that the importance of Hopkins' influence stems from, quote, the fact that the theology and doctrines that Hopkins embraced were the ones that embraced me and my generation. And he goes on to discuss how his Catholic education, um, in, under, in his Catholic education, his understanding matched, he says, that of Hopkins. So the theology and, and doctrines that Hopkins embraced were the ones that embraced me and my generation. In spite of the parallel he creates here, his use of the passive tense marks a point of difference. While Hopkins embraced Catholic theology, he describes being embraced by it. His description of Hopkins embracing this theology suggests active and willing acceptance of Catholic beliefs. But speaking about himself, he uses the verb embraced by in the sense of held close rather than accept willingly. So while he makes a parallel between the poets here, an important line of difference persists. Unlike Hopkins, Heaney does not, I think, he does not embrace Catholic Orthodox belief. What is clear from the letters, notebooks, and poems is that Hopkins submits to God and has a devotional Catholic faith. Heaney doesn't, or he doesn't have it in the same way. For Hopkins, this devotion is an active form of submission. The first words of the wreck of, of the Deutschland are, Thou mastering me, God. And the poem considers mastery, melting, and mercy. Fundamentally, the poem celebrates Hopkins' conversion through grace. Stanza two begins, I did say yes. Hopkins' embracing of God and of Catholic doctrine involves submitting to the will of the divine other. Healy is interested in the dynamics of mastery and submission, of active and passive processes for the creation of poetry in particular and how those active and passive processes combine. In his essay on Hopkins' poetry, The Fire and the Flint, he tries to position Hopkins as being more concerned with mastery than melting, but it doesn't quite ring true. This is, I think, because he needs own ideas about theology and poetry are perhaps rather more on the side of mastery than submission. 
I'll return to that essay later, but first I want to look at an early poem of Heaney's, The Forge, and compare it to Hopkins's Felix Randall to begin to consider some of the ways he used the words Hopkins' example. The Forge um, was published in Heaney's second book of poetry, Door into the Dark, published by Faber in 1969. As the title suggests, Door into the Dark invites the reader to a threshold of discovery, to that liminal space, the doorway. I'm going to read the poem in a moment, so don't worry yet. So the context of the book is this liminal, this, this sort of sense of liminal spaces, passageways, moving between and into physical spaces, spaces, and between periods of time and memory. Door into the dark opens in the dark of night. The very first poem in the book is called Night Peace, and it opens with a question, must you know it again? So the book begins in darkness and unknowing. There's a kind of poetic via negativa at work, a negative way, a way of describing something by saying what it is not. It's a theological approach which sees the experience of the divine as ineffable and welcomes the experience of unknowing. He needs door into the dark is a door into unknowing. And this way creates an opportunity for revelation. And I think we see something of this in this sonnet, The Forge. So I'll be on. Forge. All I know is a door into the dark. Outside, old axles and iron hoops rusting. Inside, the hammered anvil's short pitched ring, the unpredictable fantail of sparks or hiss when a new shoe toughens in water. The anvil must be somewhere in the center, horned as a unicorn, at one end square, set there, immovable, an altar, where he expands himself in shape and music. Sometimes, leather aproned, hairs in his nose, he leans out on the jam, recalls a clatter of hoofs where traffic is flashing in rows, then grunts and goes in with a slam and flick to beat real iron out to work the bellows. I want to set the forge alongside the poem by Hopkins, Felix Randall. And I'm delighted to say that Irene is going to read Felix Randall for us much better than I ever could hope to do. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. You have the poem in front of you, so I'm going to welcome Irene. To <coughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Felix Randall. <coughs> Felix Randall. The farrier, oh, is he dead then? My duty all ended, who have watched this mould of man, big boned and hardy handsome, pining, pining till time when reason rambled in it, and some fatal four disorders fleshed there, all contended. Sickness broke him, impatient. He cursed at first, but mended, being anointed, and all, though a heavenly our heart began some months earlier, since I had our sweet reprieve and ransom tendered to him. Ah oh, well, God rest him, or road ever he offended. This seeing the sick endears them to us, us to is in dears. My tongue had taught thee comfort. Touch had quenched thy tears, thy tears that touched my heart, child Felix, poor Felix Randall. How far from then, forethought of all thy more built boisterous years, when thou at the random grim forge Powerful amidst peers, didst fettle for the great grey dray horse, his bright and battering sandal. Mm -hmm.
scandal was dated April 28, 1880, and it was composed in Liverpool, where Hopkins was serving as a parish priest at St Francis Xavier's. This was a slum parish, and Hopkins was appalled by the poverty and physical conditions he witnessed there. We can see it's a Petrarchan sonnet. You can see the A B B A A B B A rhymes at the beginning, so ended in the first, contended in the fourth, mended in the fifth, offended in the eighth, uh, and, and, and the rhymes between um, chimings of handsome sun, sun ransom, uh, and then the rhyme of C C C D C C D. Um, it differs in its rhythm in its rhythm from a traditional Petrarchan sonnet, so it's not iambic pentameter. Um, Hopkins noted that the poem is in sprung and outriding rhythm, six foot lines, as you might expect. It's a moving elegy to a blacksmith who had died and a member of Hopkins' parish. Although the poem reflects that sickness broke him and mourns his death, it remembers Felix big boned and hardy handsome, showing something of Hopkins' attraction to the craftsman. The poem concludes with an image of Felix in his boisterous years, in his prime fettling a shoe horse for the great grey dray horse, a horseshoe described as his bright and battering sandal. Though the forge is described as grim, the blacksmith's labours render him powerful amidst peers. In the middle section of the poem, we see Hopkins tend to the farrier as a priest, being anointed and all. I had our sweet reprieve and ransom tendered to him. Hopkins recalls administering the sacrament of holy oil and of holy communion. It is through Christ's sacrifice that Felix is offered sweet reprieve and ransom. And this is also a shared experience, our reprieve. And that our, I think, describes not only the moment of spiritual intimacy between priest and parishioner, but the shared experience of each communicant within the whole church community. I suppose what strikes me here by contrast is how profoundly Heaney's poetry seems to be concerned with individual experience and with portraits of the solitary male labourer, somewhat at a distance from any immediate community, spiritual or otherwise. And such portraits are also self-portraits, images for the poet. Hopkins gives us a portrait of a male labourer and craftsman, but one fundamentally in relationship with the priest, and through the sacraments with God and the church. Graham's story comments that more powerfully than any of his other poems, Felix Randall brings together priest and poet. And I want to return to this idea, but first reflect a little bit on Heaney's poem. Like Felix Randall, the forge is a sonnet, but not a Petrarchan one. You can see that the um, we start out with A, B, B, A, dark, rusting ring sparks, but the rhyme scheme shifts in line five. Uh, so he has a greater number of rhymes than Hopkins four. It's also in pentameter, so there are five feet per line against Hopkins six. All I know is a door into the dark. I have those three stressed syllables, all I know. It seems here that this is, this is points to the kind of the fullness of the entirety of knowledge, everything that is the all. But it's also its opposite. If we stress the first word, all, I know, it's not everything, but one thing, the only thing I know, all I know, the only thing I know. And then there's the lovely iambic lull of a door into the dark. The speaker stands in a threshold space, in a doorway, a dark way, between knowledge and its lack. He is poised between spaces, at the entry point to somewhere, which is also an exit. He observes his surroundings, outside old axles, solitary objects from the past, history reddening slowly. The objects are solid, but not static, for we are shown spindles and hoops, things summoning movement, rotation. And we see at the center the anvil, from the old English word for beat and on. And as well as seeing the anvil, we hear the metal beaten in the assonance in the deep ah vials of hammered anvil in the third line. And then the higher, lighter verbal music of the trill of monosyllables and hard consonant stresses, short pitched ring 
You can hear Hopkins' stresses and sprung rhythm in the line, the hammered anvil's short pitched ring. Under his spell, just as a smithy expends himself in shape and music, Heaney makes verbal music of description. In Stepping Stones, Heaney provides a context for the poem. He says it was inspired by the blacksmith Barney Devlin in his forge on the roadside at Hill Head. Here, he says, you have the noise of the anvil, the, the noise of myth in the anvil, and the noise of the 1940s in the passing cars, as ordinary or, or as archetypal as you care to make it. Heaney's representation of the smithy isn't an idealised portrait. He has hair than his nose and grunts, and in that sense, he's an ordinary man. But he's also a music maker and an archetypal lyric poet. If we think of the origins of lyric poetry and song in the playing of a lyre as a ritual of celebration or remembrance right back to Sappho in the 7th century BC. Like the lyric poet, the smithy works in shape and music, sound and form. Hopkins' title names a man, Felix Randall, and the first words of the poem again name and portray him. He's at pains to honour and remember the farrier and his relationship with him, a relationship initiated and sustained by Catholic faith and practice. Heaney's sonnet doesn't name Barney Devlin, either in the poem or in the title. Instead, the poem commences with the lyric I. His fascination is not with Devlin, but with the artful power of his craft, and in turn the artful power of poetry, the other work of shape and music. The speaker describes outside and inside, a visual depiction of the space outside the fort, and then an aural one, the sounds within. There is sight and sound, first a fantail of flame, then sparks and hiss. But he does not quite venture inside. The anvil must be somewhere in the centre, he surmises. The anvil is solid and secure, described as immovable and square, and mythic as a unicorn. Crucially, however, Heaney makes the anvil an altar. This altar sits at the centre of the forge and in the centre of Heaney's sonnet. Yet it is not an altar in the Orthodox Catholic sense. And there are no references to God, priests, sacraments, or the church in the poem. The altar is differently central to Felix Randall. Lines 5 to 11 of Hopkins' sonnet describe sacramental practice, the forgiveness and redemption made possible at the altar and in the sacraments administered by the priest. What we can see Heaney doing here, I think, is borrowing Hopkins' images and translating them for his own more secular ends. In the forge, the smithy's labour has a sacred charge, and this craftsman is the poet's double. In a sense, the eye of the first line disappears as it becomes a portrait of the artist. So is the poet, then, also a priest figure? I want to come back to that question towards the end of my talk. To stay with the poem The Forge a little bit longer, think a little bit about the title of the poem. The meaning of the poem's title, well, it seems almost too obvious for comment, and yet many meanings adhere to it and attach to it. And I think naming things with such clarity is one of Heaney's many gifts. What is plain and simple in his word choice actually allows for great complexity. So in its noun form, the forge is a blacksmith's workshop, a smithy. It's a space, a workshop or factory, containing a furnace for melting metal. And it is also the refining furnace itself, which takes us to forge in its verb form, to make or shape a metal object by heat and hammering, <laughs> the process of making, perhaps to your imitation. The Latin origin of forge is fabricare, fabricate, in the sense of a manufactured object or workshop. So the forge foregrounds invention and skillful making, not only the smithy's labour, but he needs art. And these are making processes at once personal and communal, calling to mind as it does Stephen Dedalus from James Joyce's portrait of the artist and his wish to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of and in the last poem in the book, Bogland, Heaney forges his own myth of Irish consciousness, as well as Joyce of the risk of fraudulence or forgery. Forge is also close in sound to force, and to forge ahead has something of this forcefulness about it. In the essay on Hopkins that I mentioned earlier, The Fire and the Flint, Heaney considers Hopkins' 
poetry and his priesthood in order to argue for the force of poetry or the force of his own poetry more generally. The essay focuses on Hopkins' poem, The Wreck of the Deutschland, in which he reflects on the actions of the Godhead as being both actions of mercy and of mastery. With an anvil ding and a fire in him, forge thy will, or rather, rather than stealing a spring through him, melt him, but master him still. Describing what he calls the paradox of the religious vocation, he picks up on these enlivening aspects of Hopkins' work, melting and mastering, and he applies them to the poetic vocation. He considers the composition of poetry by setting up two modes which he calls the masculine and feminine, the former to describe the language of address or assertion and the labour of design, and the latter to signal divination and revelation, mastery and melting. He's influenced in this regard very strongly by Robert Graves and his book The White Goddess, and really this idea of what a sort of feminine mood and figure, the breath, the inspiration. Uh, that inspires the male poet who's able to kind of create form and give design to this idea um, of, of something kind of inspired. So it's again this sort of active and passive mode of, of, of writing. Um, poetry is at once an act of assertion and reception, first reception, kind of the reception of inspiration, and then the assertion that comes through form. And we see this in the poem The Given Note, where music is produced by the fiddler player's physical movements. And yet we read the tune comes from nowhere. It sounds as spirit music and rephrases itself into the air. So on the one hand, something very immaterial, spiritual, air-like, from nowhere. On the other hand, something very material indeed, the kind of the movements of the, um, the fiddle player with his instrument. And I think he's really interested in both those modes of being. He gets that very much from Hopkins and this idea of mastery and melting. There's something of this at work in forward, I think, in the last line of the poem, you'll remember that the work of the smithy is to beat real iron out. So there's that force, the beat. But it's also to work the bellows. And to work the bellows is a gentler form of labour. Working with a bag, now empty, now full. It's a belly, a vessel, a passageway for air. And we have the hard consonant T sign, beat out, which gives way to the long vials of bellows. So we have iron and air in this last line. We have the visible and the invisible, earth and sky, emptiness and fullness, assertion and reception. He need learn from Hopkins, I think, how to play the vial and consonant signs off one another and how to use those signs to um, bring in these kind of these much, much bigger ideas actually about what poetry is and even what, what theological understanding is. So the smithy's work has a sacramental or sacred gleam. Working at the anvil and altar, he is a priestly figure. A divine fire seems to burn at the centre, a refining fire. As Hopkins writes in God's Grandeur, and he wrote it, it's probably slightly larger than <laughs> you can see it on this slide. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. Heaney writes of Hopkins, his understanding of the Christian mystery and the poetic mystery were structured in the same way. And in this essay, he draws on the letter that Hopkins wrote to Coventry Patmore, in which Hopkins is discussing Keats' poetry in very gendered terms. Hopkins talks about his masculine power and manly virtues. Um, from there, Heaney begins to read Hopkins' early work. He's looking at poems like A Vision of Mermaids and Henry Purcell, and he says this um, about the early work. His posture in the early work um, is one of surrender to experience, whereas in his mature work it is one of mastery, of penetration. His own music thrusts and throngs, and it is forged. It is the way words strike off one another, the way they are drilled, marched, and countermarched rather than the way they philander and linger among themselves, that constitutes his proper music. He tries to read Hopkins's compositional practice as one of mas as mastery and masculine penetration. The etymology of the root thrust and throng is to press with force and even violence. Note the militaristic language here. 
and the anxiety about effeminacy. Against readings of Hopkins that emphasise the importance of feminine modes of writing and the significance of Mary as muse, Heaney wants to reclaim the masculine and masterful in Hopkins. You might wonder why he feels the need to do that in 1974. Focusing on the siren figure in Hopkins' sonnet to Robert Bridges, Heaney claims a siren strain rather than a birth push is his poetic act. A siren strain rather than, so he's much more inside of father than mother in the way that he tries to read Hopkins here. And there's a very obvious anxiety about female labour. Ultimately, Hopkins' artistic act is, in Heaney's view, a masculine forging rather than a feminine incubation. The crucial element in Hopkins, he argued, is the penetrative masculine spur of flame. In reading Hopkins' poetry in terms of mastery, he de-emphasises the importance of melting. And I think his assessment overreaches, and I think it obscures some important elements of Hopkins' <coughs> work. What he cannot quite admit to are the ways in which Hopkins' poetry is allied to the dynamics and pleasures of submission expressed most often as submission to the will of God. Indeed, Heaney's reading obscures the extent to which Hopkins was profoundly troubled by the master involved in poetic composition, so troubled that he burned manuscripts of his poems as an act of self-censorship. If Heaney is right that for uh, Hopkins, the Christian mystery and the poetic mystery were structured in the same way, both processes involve vulnerability and submission. In one of the so-called terrible sonnets, No Worse, There Is None, Hopkins cries out in desperation for comfort and consolation. Comforter, where? Where is your comforting? Mary, mother of us, where is your relief? He reflects in this poem that my cries heave on an age-old anvil, wince and sing. The anvil is a site of sorrow. Heaney doesn't risk anything close to this degree of vulnerability. In the forge, his anvil is a site of forging and force. In Felix Randall, Hopkins shows us the farrier's vulnerable body, his pining flesh, broken by sickness and fatal disorders. And the forge itself is grim. Heaney's blacksmith, by contrast, seems as immovable as his anvil altered. His horseshoe toughens. At the centre of Hopkins's poem are Catholic sacraments, and explicit references to heaven, God, and the forgiveness of sin. Hopkins shows us the relationship between farrier and priest, and between both man and God. The ministration of the sacraments is an intimate scene, and it's intimate in two directions. The priest has tendered the sacraments, and tended to Felix Randall, but in touching the man and quenching his tears, he has also been touched in return. Thy tears that touched my heart. While an altar sits at the centre of Heaney's poem, his is a secular altar. It's a site of solitary labour where the craftsman expends himself in shape and music. Heaney takes from Hopkins' sonnet the presence of the sacraments and the ritual of anointing, but no priest appears in Heaney's poem. Not sharing Hopkins' Jesuit vocation, Heaney secularises the role of the priest, translating it for poetic rather than religious ends. Reading The Forge against Felix Randall, then, we see that the Jesuit priest has been erased, and in his place, the solitary smithy, whose labour, with his fantail of sparks, appears to have a sacred charge. As a figure for the poet, the blacksmith's artistry is not made in service to God, but to the extraordinary power of lyric poetry as he perceives it. And this enables him to retain a kind of mastery, I think, in his conceptualisation poet's role. Well, it's early on Saturday morning, so I thought, why not, you know, war everybody out with a quick turn to transubstantiation. Um, I do want to touch on that very briefly, um, and then, and, and then we'll, we'll, I'll wrap up by saying a couple more things about mastery and, and vulnerability. And there's a lot more to say about this, and I, I won't have time, but I'll just say one or two words um, about this. So central to Hopkins' theological imagination and poetic practice, was the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. And as early as June 1864, Hopkins wrote this to E.H. Coleridge. The great aid to belief and object of belief is the doctrine of the real presence in the blessed sacrament of the altar. Religion without that is sombre, dangerous, illogical. 
With that, it is not to speak of its grand consistency and certainty. Love alone. Hold that and you will gain all Catholic truth. As we have seen, like Hopkins, Amy makes the altar, altar central to his sonnet, but his is a secular altar. In his essay on Hopkins, Heaney reads the poem as an act of love, a faithful imitation of Christ, and a sign of grace. He really wants the poem, the individual poem, to be able to be these things that he sees in Hopkins' work, and particularly in Rebecca George's sonnet, a faithful imitation of Christ, a sign of grace. And Heaney draws on the idea of transubstantiation in an early poem called Black Fruit Picking, which he published in his first collection, Death of Anapolis, in 1966. It's a wonderful poem. Um, I've written about it at, at more length, just to pick up on this a kind of key aspect of it this morning. He describes the blackberry at first in his poem as a glossy purple clot, the substance of which he likens to blood. He and his blackberries transcend their normal physical properties and exude a new substance. You read this. You ate that first one, and its flesh was sweet like thickened wine. Summer's blood was in it, leaving stains upon the tongue and lust for picking. So we have flesh and wine and blood. Heaney's Eucharistic metaphor likens the blackberries to the word made flesh. The blackberry has both, both flesh and blood. These are the gifts of the sacraments of the mass. Picking and eating the blackberry describes not only a moment of childhood pleasure or sexual revelation, but a sacrament blackberry becomes the sign of grace. Furthermore, as the blackberries overflow the brim of the bath in the poem, so the sacrament extends beyond the formal frame to the reader tasting the poem's words. Someone in the poem consumes the blackberry, you ate that first one, but simultaneously the reader is consuming the poem. Blackberry picking draws on the theological imagery of the Blessed Sacrament that celebrates Christ's death and resurrection, resurrection, but it makes no mention of Christ or God. Through the blackberry, the speaker eats the flesh and drinks the blood, suggestive of Christ's death. In Catholic theology, transubstantiation underpins the sacrament, the belief that the elements become the real presence of Christ at the moment of consecration. He needs metaphor points to the theology of transubstantiation, and yet his recourse to sacramental theology again serves a poetic rather than a theological end. Heaney is interested in transubstantiation as a metaphor for the possibilities of poetic form, a change in substance that describes poetic elements rather than the elements of the mass. Again, this is, I think, part of what he learns and draws from Hopkins, but also what he translates in the way that he applies and thinks through Hopkins' writing in his own context. In The Fire and the Flint, Heaney reads Hopkins in a Christological Catholic frame, but Heaney has not embraced Catholic beliefs as Hopkins did. In both his essay on Hopkins and his black and in Blackberry Picking, Heaney's metaphor for poetry is a form of imitatio Christi, or the imitation of Christ. Crucially, however, Heaney secularizes the process of imitatio. Heaney's poetics maintain the structure of a mimetic relationship between God and man, but change his purpose from representing Christ to representing the world. He needs lack of orthodox faith and the absence of Christ from his poems mark his different difference from Hopkins. The sacramental imagery of blackberry picking introduces from the outset of his career, he needs a search for real presence in poetry. Yet this real presence is not the presence of Christ. It is what the literary critic W.K. Wimsatt calls the fullness of actually presented meaning made possible by the well-made poem. There's a lot more I could say about new criticism as a mode of reading and the way that he has brought up to think about how to read the poem, what the poem can do, what we do when we look at a poem and the power that the individual lyric has, the idea that all the meaning that you need really, or anything that you might, nothing that you can, everything that you can bring to the poem is essentially enough. You don't really need any other kind of historical context or other kind of ways of thinking about the poem. But the fullness of meaning is already in the poem itself. That's a way of reading that he kind of grew up with and was schooled in in Queens, which there's more I can say about that. I think it's very interesting thinking. So while sacramental theology shapes Heaney's conceptualization of the belief in his role as, in, as poet and the communicative powers of language, it ultimately comes to service his belief in the extraordinary power of lyric poetry. So just a few last words then on mastery and vulnerability. I think Heaney doesn't quite risk the vulnerability that Hopkins risks 
Heaney doesn't portray a despairing or depressed states of mind. While some of the poems from Heaney's last book, Human Shame, show us something of his experience of physical illness and recovery, there's nothing close to the frightful, sheer, no man fathomed psychological terrain of Hopkins' work. And Heaney's final image in that book is of a kite rising exultant and alone. This tendency towards uplift in Heaney's work and what we might call the invulnerable aspect of Heaney's poetics reveals some of the limits, perhaps, of his poetic achievement. We live in precarious times. Globalised, networked and interconnected, our experience these days of ourselves and of the political economy of the planet is one of profound insecurity. Financial collapse, cyber attacks, global terror, state security fears, insidious surveillance and the threat of new borders, ecological instability, climate change, food and fuel scarcity, zero hour contracts and precarious forms of labour. In these precarious days, Hopkins' legacy is bound to prove more enabling and enduring than ever. And so for that reason, you must keep going with this wonderful festival for decades and decades to come. By contrast, I think the invulnerable aspect of Heaney's poetics begin to reveal something of the limits of where his poetry will go. Writing out his vulnerability to painful states of mind was part of what enabled Hopkins to reinvigorate the sonnet form. Oh, the mind, mind has mountains, cliffs of fall. This exposure of precariousness is part of what I love in Hopkins' work. But perhaps I'm being a little unfair to Heaney, and perhaps he learned more from Hopkins' vulnerable poetics than I have yet given him credit for. In the forge, after all, the first truth is this. All I knew is a door into the dark. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.